One other thing that I loved hearing about you, how you navigated it, was when you joined Uriah Heap. And I'd love to hear about your audition when you got that. I thought that was pretty cool. Great. Could you it talk about it? Family. And again, it's all full of tips. I, I did it when I was teaching at BIM in Brighton for a couple of years. I used to tell them the same thing because I, I ended up teaching, I think, about three months. Mm -hmm. And then I got too busy with Heap. So the last three months, the students that were lucky enough to be there got to hear it. Basically, what happened was doing a lot of clinics and one I used to always visit. I used to, there's a few I used to go back to the shops year after year after year. Just really, they just really enjoyed the clinic. They enjoyed me. I enjoyed doing them. So I get used to ask, uh, ask to go back and do them. And one of them was repercussion in Hull. And okay. uh, Trevor Boldo, who sadly uh, died now, he was the bass player in Heap at the time. Well, he's one of the Spiders of Mars with David Bowie. And when I um, found out about it, obviously I knew he was a great player and a great bloke. But every time I went up to um, Hull, he were on tour, because I always do a lot of shows, they were on tour, he couldn't make the clinic. Well, this one particular time he could, and he came to see the clinic. Right. And afterwards he said, that's some of the best drumming I've heard for a long while. It's absolutely fantastic. He said, you're staying up here, aren't you? I said, yeah, I'm staying up. He said, um, fancy coming over for lunch tomorrow. Well, of course I'm going to go over there for lunch. I had a good old chat and everything like that. And that was it. Didn't think anything of it. And it was only about, it was about eight years later that I got a phone call of Trev. He said, what are you up to, Russ? I used to speak to him regularly, by the way. And he said, well, what are you up to? I said, well, you know, the usual sessions, bits and pieces, grabbing this, grabbing that. <laughs> he said, we just signed a, a recording contract and we got a world tour for 18 months with it. And our drummer will won't last you know he's out of shape he's forgetting things his just health is not good enough um and so we're getting a new drummer and i put your name forward i went oh great brilliant he said but the, the only catch is that the management are doing it and now we've got 240 drummers auditioning for it hmm. so i went don't make no difference to me you know what i mean uh Give me more info on it. So he gave me more info. I said, leave it with me. So left it with me. It was about a month later, I think they were doing the uh, the auditions. And I went, right. So I did a bit of research because I didn't want to join another flipping old band and do that. Old... But this was different, mm. right? This was a, a, a different thing. Thing that you sort of dream for, if you like. Mm. Oh, right. Okay, right. There's two ways I can play this. They've had Lee Kerr's late for 37 years. Now, do I imitate him because they're used to him? Or is it my time to be Russell Gilbrook and I do it how I think it should be done, which might be fresh for them, and they're certainly going to like my energy. Do I take yeah. a chance? So I thought, yes, too right. I'm going to be me. Why should I live in the shadows of someone else? I'll be me. So the audition come up. Now, this is a clever thing. They said to me, okay, they whittled it down. There was a lot of chances on the phone. They could tell on the phone, you don't even know what a pair of sticks is by. So the 240 slowly got, or quickly got put down to the yeah. last 40 in London over two weeks. So they run me up and said, right, okay, uh, we've done one week. The second week, can you come in on Monday? I said, well, how long is it going? He said, we're doing Monday to Friday. I said, oh, okay. This was me being clever. I went, Monday, oh. I said, I'm actually quite busy next week. Um, I'll tell you what, I might be able to move something. Can I do Friday? Yeah, of course you can do Friday. Yeah, what, what do you want? Like 12 o'clock? I said, well, what time are you doing it from? He said, well, we're starting at 10 and finishing about four. Hmm. I said, right, okay, I'll do 12 o'clock. Right, so we put it down. Deliberately, I rang him up the next day. Oh, I can't do 12 o'clock. I forgot. I've got a dentist appointment. Can you, and I've got to get to London and everything like that. I can't do the last one at four. Can I? I know it's a bit cheeky. In it. No, that's fine. No one's in it. So I, I created the last audition for myself. Yeah, I've got a big drum kit. We're using the house kit there. I said, oh, no, 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 no. I said, I'll destroy that in 10 seconds. <laughs> I said, well, I'm, my last, I'm doing the last one anyway. So I'll just bring my kit and put it up. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. So I wrangled the last audition, the last, you know, the last one ever. Yeah. And my kit. Of course, I was up there at nine in the morning because I wanted to hear the competition. Yep. And there was some drummers up there with the headphones on doing this, doing this. And uh, you, you certainly won't get the audition. If you've got to listen to the stuff now, right, you've had it. Mm -hmm. I've done my own work. 
So there's yeah. five songs that they wanted everyone to 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 learn that showed the different technicality and difficulties and stuff. Hmm. So anyway, they've had a nightmare apparently for the first week. They've had a few people that have nailed it, but they just sound like Lee Kerslake, mm -hmm. which was okay, but they weren't very inspired. But a lot of them, I won't name uh, some of the famous drummers that went, because it's not fair, but a lot of them, honestly, they were worn out. They couldn't believe that people couldn't play. They weren't doing a double handed shuffle for easy living. They're going to, to get to do to get because it completely loses the feel. Mm. Anyway, some people don't learn all the five songs. So it comes to me. So I'm setting up. Have you learned the five songs? So I said, no. <laughs> and their faces of horror because they've had such a long day. I said, I've learned the whole set. I can play it. The whole set tomorrow if you want me to do a gig i'll do the gig and you should have the atmosphere and the uplifting and the smiles and the but oh it was fantastic so a big tip that was go the whole mile if you get preparations everything mm -hmm. so we did the audition now we did add a jam standing ovation from the crew everyone's clapping like that i come around the kit talking to mick box after 10 minutes hang on a minute I said, you're talking to me like I've got the audition. He said, you have. Let's go around the, the pub now and get pissed. <laughs> that was it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, a lot of inspiration there. And just that confidence is something I really admire about you, that that yeah. really can make a difference. And, and how have you developed that, that confidence and continue to express it? Was that a conscious process for you? Or how did that show up, man? Yeah, it's a... Yeah, there's always that fine line, isn't there, between confidence and sort of arrogance and blah, blah, blah. I've never been arrogant. You know, I'll go to the pub and play in front of five people tomorrow and 100,000 people in Brazil the next day. It makes no difference to me. I like playing drums, right? Yeah. But confidence allows you to get through what potentially could be the only chance you get. Mm. You know, in an audition, they're not going to say, come back next week if you completely mess it up. If you if you've really done your homework and you're confident with the ability of how you play, mm -hmm. you take that confidence with you. There's no good with the waterline being here. You know what I mean? Oh my god! You've got mm -hmm. to make sure that you're never stretching your ability on anything. And no, there was nothing there that was difficult for me to play. Sure. Even when we did the when the first song we did between two worlds, um, Mick was about to. You know, count it in. I stopped him. I said, "Hang on a minute." He said, "Well, I'm just going to give you." I said, "I got the tempo." I said, "I'll I'll count you in," and I screamed it. You know, and I could feel that they was, oh, I've got someone taking in charge. Jesus, you know, you could feel that from them, and it's a great feeling. And all that does yeah. is keeps my nerves out of the equation because I've taken hold of it, mm -hmm. and 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 I because you know you know what it's like if you're. If you are a good player, there's no reason to be nervous. The situation doesn't dominate because you're you're well capable of knowing how to play. If something's tricky, the nerves sit in because you're waiting for the mistake. This is a big problem that most people have when they do recording. As soon as they see that red light go on, right, or it's a take, they're now panicking because they're waiting for the mistake. If you wait for the mistake, you're going to make one. You need to be so confident that, yeah, I've learned that. I've learned that. I can play like that. Boof, it's done. Job done. Mm -hmm. And then if they don't like you because of, um, I don't know, perhaps you sped up in all the fields or the groove wasn't quite as nice as um, Windsor's up there, then so be it. At least you presented how you want to present it. And when Mick got asked when I got the audition, he said Russ came in and made the drum chair his own. And that's what we wanted. Mm, yeah. and, and that was it, really. Brilliant.